Hello everybody, I am Dr. Jitendra Pandey and I am your instructor for this module on information security. After the completion of this lecture, the learner should be able to define information security management principles, know the procedures for developing information security system, understand four pillars of any security system, define CIA principle, know the goals of information security and understand various security mechanisms. Information security means protecting data, information, and information systems from unauthorized access, use, disclosure, disruption, modification, or destruction. Information security management is a process of defining the security controls in order to protect the information assets. IT security is sometimes referred to as computer security. Information technology security is the information security applied to the technology. It is worthwhile to note that a computer does not necessarily means a home desktop. A computer means any device with a processor and some memory. Such devices can range from a non-network standalone devices as simple as calculator to network mobile computing devices such as smartphones and tablet computers. IT security specialists are almost found in any major enterprise or establishment due to the nature and value of the data within large businesses. They are responsible for keeping all the technology within the company secure from the malicious cyber attacks that often attempt to breach into critical private information or gain control of the internal systems. Now we will discuss about the security threats associated with the IT infrastructure. Any technology can be used for the human benefits, but any technology can also be used by criminals and antisocial elements. The internet users now face a number of problems due to security threats. Periodically, our computers are affected by viruses. Virus damage or destroy the information on the computer and they spread very fast. Credit card information is stolen by the hackers. The terrorists use the internet extensively to plan attacks. And information wars are initiated by bombing servers with unwanted mails and network connections. Security threats will adversely affect individuals. They lose their privacy. They lose confidence in using the internet for e-commerce transactions and they lose confidence on the public safety measures if those measures still do not protect them. If the individual lose confidence, then the business of the enterprise involved in the e-commerce is also affected. Enterprises lose millions of dollars due to fraud on the internet. Enterprise espionage cause both direct and indirect losses to the organization. And unfortunately, many employees and ex-employees are responsible for enterprise espionage. In this information age, every individual should have a good awareness about the security issues, security policies of the organization in which he or she is working, and also the laws related to information security. People should also be aware of the ethical issues concerning the use and misuse of the information system. As information systems are technology driven, people should also have the necessary technical exposure to security systems and technologies. Every organization should have a security policy. This security policy should reflect the management's commitment to provide secure information system while protecting the privacy of the individuals. Policy should also indicate the management's approach to introduce new technologies and services and training the employees on information security. Every organization should work out the detailed procedures for developing information security system. The procedure should include identification of critical information assets, identification of threats to the information system, finding out the vulnerabilities and taking preventive measures to avoid the threats, working out the mechanism for detection of fraud and recovery of the systems after attack and training for the people. For providing security, a number of security products need to be installed in the enterprise. 
These products include antivirus softwares, firewalls, surveillance system, intrusion detection system, etc. However, just installing these products alone will not provide the necessary security. People, policies, and procedures are very important. It needs to be emphasized again that people, policies, procedures, and products are the four pillars of any security system. Together, they provide the solution for providing physical security, computer security, and network security. The three fundamental principles of security are availability, integrity, and confidentiality, and are commonly referred to as CIA tried, which also forms the main objective of any security program. The level of security required to accomplish these principles differ per company because each has its own unique combination of business and security goals and requirements. All security controls, mechanisms, and safeguards are implemented to provide one or more of these principles. All risks, threats, and vulnerabilities are measured for their potential capability to compromise one or all of the CIA principles. The first security principle is confidentiality. It ensures that the necessary level of secrecy is enforced at each junction of data processing and prevents unauthorized disclosure. This level of confidentiality should prevail while data resides on systems and devices within the network as it is transmitted and once it reaches its destination. The threat sources to confidentiality are network monitoring, shoulder surfing, stealing password files, and social engineering. Countermeasures to address these threats are encrypting data as it is stored and transmitted by using network padding, implementing a strict access control mechanism and data classification, and training personnel on proper procedures. The second security principle is integrity which means that the integrity of data is protected when the assurance of accuracy and reliability of information and system is provided and unauthorized modification is prevented. The threat sources to integrity are viruses, logic bombs, and backdoors. And the countermeasures to address these threat sources are strict access control, intrusion detection, and hashing. And the third security principle is availability. Availability ensures reliability and timely access to data and resources to authorize individuals. And the threat sources to availability are devices or software failure, environmental issues like heat, cold, humidity, static electricity, and contamination can also affect system availability. And denial of service attacks. And the countermeasures to address these threat sources are maintaining backups to replace the failed system, intrusion detection system to monitor the network traffic and host system activities, and use of certain firewall and router configurations. Now let us discuss goals of information security. The goals can be broadly divided into prevention, detection, and recovery. Let us start with our first goal, that is prevention. As we all know, prevention is better than cure. But then, it is not always possible to take enough measures to ensure that there will be no attacks. However, the security system should aim to ensure that the possible attack will fail. This is prevention. One of the examples of preventive measures that we take in our daily life to protect IT infrastructure is protecting a computer system by setting up a password for preventing unauthorized access to the system or networks. The second example is installing antivirus software on every system so that the files do not get corrupted by the virus that is spread through emails or pen drive, etc. It needs to be emphasized that it is very difficult to foresee all possible attacks and device preventive solutions. The next goal of information security is detection. This goal is to devise mechanism to find out that an attack is taking place 
or an attack has taken place. If the attack is discovered while it is taking place, the damage being done can be monitored and if possible, the attack can be stopped. If the attack has already taken place, the damage that has been done should be detected. Detection is followed by working out possible preventive measures so that such type of attacks can be prevented in the future. The third security goal is recovery, that is, repair the damage done by the attack. Suppose a file is deleted through an attack. Restoring the file from the backup is an example of recovery. So, the system security should work out on backup policy. Another example is, if some records in a database were modified by an attacker to restore the database from the backup. However, it may not always possible to restore the system to a state it was before the attack. For example, the database backup may not contain all the latest modifications. However, a recovery mechanism has to be worked out in such a way that the damage is minimal and also the system can be restored to the original status to the maximum possible extent in minimum possible time. Now we will discuss about security mechanisms. To provide secure communication, cryptography is extensively used. Cryptography facilitates providing the three information security services that are confidentiality, integrity and non-reputation. Confidentiality is ensured because only those who have the encryption key can decode the information. Integrity is ensured to some extent because only those who know the encryption key have sent the information. Certainly, since authorized users only can send the encrypted information, a user cannot deny that he sent the information and hence non-reputation is also ensured. First of all, we'll discuss some of the basic terminologies that we'll use throughout this lecture. The first one is plain text or clear text. It is the message and it is denoted by M. Next is encryption. It is the process of encoding the message and it is denoted by E. Ciphertext. Ciphertext is an encrypted message and it is denoted by capital C. Decryption. Decryption is process of decoding of ciphertext and it is denoted by capital D. Cryptography. It is most closely associated with the development and creation of mathematical algorithms used to encrypt and decrypt messages. It is about secure communication in the presence of adversities. Cryptanalysis. It is the science of analyzing and breaking encryption schemes. Cryptology. It is the combination of cryptography and cryptanalysis. Now let us understand the concept with the help of an example. Suppose there are two people, Alice and Bob, who want to talk and pass notes back and forth and these notes are private and they are using a public forum such as internet for passing these notes. In this example, Eve is interested in a private conversation between Bob and Alice and can do much more than eavesdropping. Like, Eve changed the content of the message that could be catastrophic. The goal of cryptography is to protect this communication and make it secure. So we came up with the notion of kryptonium pipe where Alice starts sending message using the kryptonium pipe which is a secure medium and Eve could not read, temper or access these messages during transit. So we define cryptography as a practice and study of techniques for securing communication and data in the presence of adversities. Crypto system. Crypto system consists of different parts that are needed to communicate securely. At the core of crypto system is an encryption program that is denoted by capital E, decryption program that is denoted by capital D, encryption key that is denoted by KE, decryption key that is denoted by KD, plain text that is denoted by M, and cipher text that is denoted by C. Now let us see how encryption system works. Alice encrypted her plain text message, which here is represented by M, 
using an encryption key represented by KE and the outcome is ciphertext. The ciphertext goes across public forum. If Eve try to eavesdrop the message, Eve will get a ciphertext C. At the end of the public forum comes out another ciphertext that is denoted by C dash. And we hope C is equal to C dash. But Eve may temper it. In case the message is tempered, C and C dash are not same. Once the ciphertext is received, Bob decrypts the ciphertext with the decryption program denoted by capital D using decryption key KD. The outcome may be the original message sent by the Alice or an error. Error is very important factor to judge whether the message is tempered, in which case C is not equal to C dash. The success of crypto system essentially lies with keeping the encryption and decryption keys secret and private as the encryption and decryption programs are public and known to everyone. In the crypto systems, when both encryption and decryption keys are same, that is KE is equal to KD, it is known as private key communication or symmetric key encryption. In symmetric key encryption, both parties have same key as the key is known by both the parties, either of them accidentally exposing the key can break the security of the crypto system. There are some crypto systems where KE is not equal to KD. That is, both encryption and decryption keys are different. These crypto systems are known as public key cryptography or asymmetric key encryption. In asymmetric key encryption, every user have two keys, one public key and one private key. Private key is known to the user only and the public key of all the users is published and known to everyone. So now, if Alice wants to send any secret message to Bob, then Alice will use Bob's public key, which is known to everyone, to encrypt the message and convert the message to ciphertext and send it to Bob over public medium, that is internet, as Alice is sure that only Bob can decrypt this message as due to certain mathematical properties, the message encrypted by any user's public key can be decrypted by using that user's private key only. So, the encrypted message received by Bob can be decrypted to plain text by using Bob's private key only. Now, let us talk about hash functions. Hash function is a one-way function that is, you can create a checksum from the message but you cannot create a message from the checksum. It should also be difficult to create two messages having the same checksum. However, the second property cannot be met always. Hash functions are of two types, keyed hash functions and keyless hash functions. As the name suggests, you need a key to be shared by the sender and receiver in case of keyed hash functions. In case of keyless hash functions, there will be no need of such a key. An example of keyed hash function is using DES. The last three blocks of a ciphertext can be used as a checksum. However, this is not a very secure method because of the weakness of DES algorithm. The two keyless hash functions which are widely used are message digest 5 and secure hash algorithm. MDS produces 128-bit checksum and SHA produces 160-bit checksums. Though many keyless hash functions have been proposed in the literature, most of them prove to be insecure. Message Digest 5 and Secure Hash algorithm provide a reasonably good message authentication. Now we will discuss about digital signatures. A digital signature is a mathematical scheme for presenting the authenticity of a digital message or documents. A valid digital signature gives a recipient reason to believe that the message was created by a known sender, that the sender cannot deny having sent the message, and that the message was not altered in transit. In public key cryptography, anything Alice encrypts with Bob's public key can be decrypted by Bob with the corresponding private key. Alice can also encrypt a message with her private key which means that Bob can decrypt it with Alice public key. Since the public key is, as the name suggests, publicly available, 
This is not a very good idea if Alice want to keep that message a secret. Eve can also simply obtain a copy of Alice public key and thus also decrypt the message. But because Alice keeps her private key to herself, Bob knows that only Alice could have encrypted this message. Bob can now be sure that this message was written by Alice. A signature on a paper message serves as a proof that the message was written by the person who signed it. Encrypting with a private key thus can be regarded as an equivalent to placing one's signature on the message. This is why this is called creating a digital signature for the message. If Alice want to keep the message a secret that only Bob is allowed to learn, she of course then simply encrypt the digitally signed message with Bob's public key. Bob first decrypts the message with his own private key and then decrypts the result with the Alice public key. He now knows that no one else could have read the message because it was encrypted using the public key and that no one but Alice could have written this message because it was encrypted using her private key. Remember that everyone using public key cryptography has two keys, one private and one public, either of which can decrypt message encrypted with other. Encrypt message as normal, first the sender encrypts the message with the recipient's public key, then the sender adds their signature to the encrypted message perhaps some text like this message is from John Smith and then encrypt the whole thing with his own private key. The recipient receives the message and decrypts it with the sender's public key which produces the digital signature and the encrypted message. The recipient then decrypts the remaining message with their own private key. If this unwrapping procedure works, revealing a legible digital signature and a legible message, then the recipient can be sure that the message was sent by the sender since only they are in possession of the private keys used to encrypt the entire message. Now let us discuss applications of digital signatures. Digital signatures offer many applications other than signing messages such as email. A digital signature can be created for any kind of file the digital signature then can be used as a proof that the file was not modified after the digital signature was created. It can also be used to make the file unique, for example, by appending a serial number to the file and signing the result. Some of the other applications of digital signature are authenticating web servers, time stamping services, authenticating software applications, electronic money transfers, etc. Now let us discuss digital certificate. Think of a situation when Alice needs a copy of Bob's public key to encrypt message to him using public key cryptography. And Bob needs Alice public key to verify any digital signatures on Alice message. Both must be sure that they have the right public key. This is where digital certificates come in. Digital certificates are messages that couple an identity to a public key. They are signed by a person or authority that creates them. If Bob trusts that authority, he can be sure that the certificates issued by that authority are genuine and so he can check that he really has Alice public key. Now let us discuss the basic principle of digital certificates. An important aspect of public key cryptography is that Alice and Bob must be convinced that they have the right public key of each other. Eve could have substituted his own public key for Bob's and then Alice would be encrypting messages intended for Bob in a way that Eve could read them. Eve could then encrypt them again with Bob's real public key so that he would not notice Alice has a run public key. If Eve does the same the other way around, all communications between Alice and Bob can be read by Eve and neither of them knows it. Alice and Bob could of course meet in person or call 
each other over the phone to verify that they have the right public keys. This is often impractical and Alice and Bob might not even know each other. For example, Alice could own a web store and use public key encryption so that her customer, Bob, can securely send her his credit card details. Now, if Bob tries to call Alice, how can he possibly know that he is talking to Alice and not to an Eve? The use of digital certificates solves this problem. A digital certificate is used to ensure that the public key of a person is really genuine. Digital certificate is a message that contains the public key of a person or an organization. Information about the owner of the public key and also how long the certificate is valid. This message will also have a digital signature so that the recipient of the certificate can make sure that the certificate is genuine. Such digital certificates are issued by an authority which can be trusted. Such authorities generally appointed by governments are also called certification authorities. So in our example, next to Alice, Bob and Eve, there is now a trusted third party, usually called Trent, because the name also starts with a T. If Alice want to have Bob's public key, she will go to Trent to ask for a copy. Trent will then send her a message containing a details of Bob's identity and Bob's public key. This message, called the Certificate of Bob's Public Key, is signed by Trent. Alice now verifies that the digital signature is correct using Trent's public key. If this is the case, she knows that she has Bob's real public key and she now also knows that Bob is called Bob. Eve is now no longer able to impersonate Bob by giving Alice a public key pretending it is Bob's. Since this public key is not signed by Trent, Alice will not accept it. And Alice is sure that Trent checked Bob's passport or driver's license before making the certificate. Of course, Eve might now try to pretend that she is Trent. If she can pull this off, she can listen in on everybody's communication. To prevent this, Alice should make sure that she really has Trent's public key. This should be quite easy. Trent could be a government agency or a notary public and so she can visit Trent and take a copy of his public key home with her. She only has to do this once and then she can securely communicate with everyone else who visited Trent and had him make a certificate. So in this lecture, we have discussed information security management principles and we have also discussed various security mechanisms. Thank you very much.